Today we're continuing with the reading of Srila Prabhupada Lamrita. I'm sure you all be happy to know that um, last week Satsrup Maharaj wrote me a letter and he's appreciating these classes very much. Particularly, he said he appreciates that we all understand that many, many devotees took part in helping to write this book. It wasn't only he, but it was with the help of so many devotees with their interviews and those who did the interviews and all of the history that was collected so that this book can be written. So the last two weeks, um, Shrutakirti, he went into his pastimes with Prabhupada. And then we had a special guest, Mandakini. She didn't really introduce herself, but she was the first devotee who was sent to Russia. Um, when Prabhupada made his first disciple, Anatoly, he named him Ananta Shanti, and his samadhi is here in our Goshala. Prabhupada had a plan that he would send a devotee to marry Anatoly. And he sent Mandakini. And she stayed there, and since that time, she made relationships in Russia and helped to open up Russia to Krishna consciousness. So she didn't personally tell the devotees uh, about the wonderful service that she had done. But until now, she's still cultivating the devotees in Russia. So we thank her very much. Um, so we'll continue now with Prabhupada Lilamrita. We had gone through Prabhupada's birth and three weeks ago I had shown you that this is Prabhupada's birthplace. It was just a small uh, body, a small home with two little rooms underneath a jackfruit tree. And that was his maternal grandfather's home. So Rajani, that was Prabhupada's mother, she went to the home of her mother, which was under this jackfruit tree, and she gave birth there, not in her husband's home. And then on the sixth day, they had the Shasti Puja, and that was at the Madan Mohan temple, which is just a short distance from Prabhupada's home. And this is the beautiful Madan Mohan deities there. The Shasti Puja on the sixth day, that's specifically for the well-being of the child and the mother, so that they can recover from the delivery nicely. So beautiful. And many times, Gaur Mohan Day would bring Prabhupada Abai uh, to, to take darshan of Madan Mohan afterwards. It was all nearby their home. And then after a few days more, they returned to their home. This is the Govinda Bhavan, where Gaur Mohan Day had a few rooms where he raised his children. And this was owned by the Malaks. Now the Malaks originally we were um, discussing a few days back about the uh, Raghunath Das Goswami and Nityananda Prabhu. How when Nityananda Prabhu descended from the spiritual world, he brought all of his gopas with him, the 12 main gopas. Now one of them was Udaran Datta Thakur. And he is Subahu Gopa in the spiritual world. And Udarandatta, he lived in a village called Saptagram. And they were the Suvarna, Suvarnas. They were from a wealthy mercantile family. And the family descendants of Udarandatta Thakur are the days 
The family name is Day, and the other family name is Seal. And the Days and the Seals, be being mercantile uh, businessmen, they came to the Calcutta area, and they settled there. And during the Mughal rule, some of the Day family, because they were very wealthy and they dealt with cloth and um, salt, so the Mughal ruler then gave them the name Malik or Malik. That means Lord. It means a very wealthy, wealthy person. So although they were still the Day and the Seal family, part of the wealthy family members were called Maliks. And it was these Maliks because Gormahan Day was all part of that large family. He was staying in one of their homes with his family. So, Abhay Charande was born into an Indian dominated by Victorian imperialism. Victorian imperialism means the queen at that time, her name was Queen Victoria. And the imperialism meant that they wanted, because if you ever go to England, Prabhupada said that England is like hell because most of the year it's rainy and cloudy and cold. We went there once in May, it was still freezing cold. And we had come just, we know how hot it is here in India, we had come with just our chapels and our saris, freezing cold. So it's like that most of the year. And they can't, you know, such a small islands, they can't grow everything because it's cold. So they had many colonies in Africa, in um, India, all over Asia, and they would draw the wealth of those countries and bring it to England. They would take the treasures and uh, the cotton and the rice and everything that they could, they would take away from their colonies for England. So that's called imperialism. When one country has many colonies and they take the wealth of those colonies. Calcutta was the capital of India. Now previously there was no Calcutta. It was just some landowners in a very, very nice area at the Bay of Bengal. There was a harbor and the British wanted to make their own capital in India because there was no real capital of India at that time because everyone had their own little states with kings, Maharajas, and they ruled separately. There was no combined country. So the British, they purchased the little plots of land from all the people, got a huge amount of land, and started constructing their buildings and created the city of Calcutta. Calcutta was the capital of India, the seat of the Viceroy. The Viceroy meant the ambassador from England who would rule India from Calcutta. His name was the Earl of Elgin and Kincardin. And the second city of the British Empire, first there was London and then there was Calcutta. Because India was the crest jewel of, uh, of, uh, of the whole British Empire because India was so full of natural resources. Europeans and Indians lived separately, although in business and education they intermingled. The British lived mostly in central Calcutta amidst their own theaters, racetracks, cricket fields, and fine European buildings. So they brought their whole culture with them. They built all their own buildings the way they, they liked it. They brought their cricket fields, they, brought, they made racetracks, polo, everything, everything British style they brought to Calcutta. The Indians lived more in North Calcutta, and that was where Prabhupada lived. Here the men dressed in dhotis and the women in saris, and while remaining loyal to the British crown, followed their traditional religion and culture. So this was the background to Prabhupada's, uh, his appearance. 
in northern Cal Calcutta, where all of the Indians lived and they still followed their traditions, but they were subservient to the British Viceroy. Abai's home at 151 Harrison Road, that was that picture of Govinda Bhavan, was in the Indian section of North Calcutta. Abai's father, Gormahan Day, was a cloth merchant of moderate income. Prabhupada said that they were not very poor and they were not very rich. Because Gormahan Day, he was a Vaishnava. And his business actually was puja. He loved to worship his deity, Radhadamadar. He would wake up in the morning, do his puja, take a little meal, take a little rest. At one o'clock, he would go to his business. There also, he would take a little rest. And then he would come home at 10 o'clock, do more puja till midnight, and then have a little something to eat and then go to sleep. So Prabhupada explained that his main business was his puja. And he did his cloth business just to maintain the family. He wasn't interested in making a lot of money. He was interested in worshiping Damodar. Yes. Gormahan Day was a cloth merchant of moderate income and belonged to the aristic, aristocratic Suvarna Vanik merchant community. He was related, however, to the wealthy Mullik family which for hundreds of years had traded in gold and salt with the British. Originally, the Mullocks had been members of the Day family, a Gotra lineage that traces back to the ancient sage Gotam. But during the Mughal period of pre-British India, a Muslim ruler had conferred the title Moloch, Lord, on a wealthy, influential branch of the Days. Then, several generations later, a daughter of the days had married into the Mullock family, and the two families had remained close ever since. So this is the relationship between the wealthy Mullocks and the day family into which Prabhupada took his birth. Now, he explained, Prabhupada, uh, one time he took the devotees to his original home and to the Thakur body of Radha Govinda, where he used to worship the deities as a child. And he quoted the verse from Bhagavad Gita, this is 642. Or, if unsuccessful after long practice of yoga, he takes his birth in a family of transcendentalists who are surely great in wisdom. Certainly such a birth is rare in this world. Because in this part of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has just explained to Arjuna about the process of Astanga Yoga. And after he explains it, Arjuna immediately, immediately said that this is impossible. I'll never be able to practice yoga because the mind is more difficult to control than the wind. So then Arjuna asked Krishna, well, what happens if you can't perfect the yoga system? Does that mean your life is ruined? Because Prabhupada gave the example that just like if you're studying to be a medical doctor and the course is six years and you only complete two years, you're nothing. You have nothing. You're not a medical doctor. You're not even a clerk because you didn't get the certificate. So Arjuna asked Krishna, well, what happens to these yogis, even myself, if I can't complete the yoga system? Do I just evaporate like a, a, a cloud in the sky when the wind comes? Is all of the attempts to practice yoga useless unless you perfect it? And then Krishna replies that no, either you take birth in the heavenly planets and enjoy for thousands of years and then you come down again to continue your yoga or you take birth in the home of great transcendentalists who are very advanced in wisdom. And that type of birth is very rare. So Prabhupada explained that that was the type of birth that he took. And he gave the example also of his spiritual master. Because his spiritual master also took birth in a family where the father was a great Vaishnava, Bhaktivinoda Thakur. 
And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati learned everything from his father. And in the same way, Prabhupada learned everything from his father. He learned how to worship the Lord. His father gave him deities, little Radha Govinda. His father gave him a rath cart so that he could do Rathiyatra. And his father taught him how to do the artis and how to observe all the festivals. So Prabhupada's religious training, he got from his family, from his father. And he says that the same training that his father gave him, that's exactly what he brought to ISKCON. All of the same practices that his father taught him, that's what Prabhupada institute, instituted into all of our temples. So, an entire block of properties on either side of Harrison Road belonged to Lokanath Malik. And Gormahan and his family lived in a few rooms of a three-story building within the Malik properties. I'll just show you that building one more time so you can understand. Very nice building. This is one of the buildings that the Malik's own. And the Day family lived in this building. It's a three-story building. Uh, now the devotees can't enter this building because after Prabhupada went to Allahabad, he took his father with him. His mother had died when he was 14 years old. So when Prabhupada gave up living in Calcutta and he took his family to Allahabad to start the Prayag pharmacy, his father came with him and they gave up those rooms and that was in the 1920s. And then in 1928, Lokanath Malak, he sold this building to Gita Press from Gorakhpur and this was their main headquarters in the Eastern Division so the Gorakhpur press the Gita press now owns this entire building so when the devotees or anyone tries to enter it they can't enter it because it's private property now across the street from the day's residence was a radical Vinda temple for the past, where for the past 150 years the Malaks had maintained worship of the deity of Radha and Krishna. This is the Radha Govinda temple and the standard was very high. There was a, just as we have in our temple, there was a big courtyard called the, called the Natta Mandir and then you went up steps and you had the beautiful darshan of Radha Govinda. And Prabhupada, even when he was in a pram, that means a baby carriage, he would go every day to take darshan of Radha Govinda Ji. And when he got a little older, he asked his father for deities. These deities, they were about this big. And Prabhupada used to imitate everything that he saw them do at the Radha Govindaji temple. He would come home, he would light the bhati and do the RT. Anything that he ate, he would offer to his little deities. And when his sister got old enough, he pulled her into that also. So the two of them would worship their little Radha Govindaji deities together. But then when Prabhupada started school, as happens with students, he got all involved with his friends and his studies and he forgot all about Radha Govindaji deities. And it wasn't until he finally got married uh, that he started again to worship the Radha Govindaji deities. And then finally he gave those deities to his sister, uh, who was also initiated by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And his sister worshipped those deities in her home. She had nine children, they all lived in the same home. They would offer everything to Radha Govindaji also. Various shops on the Malik properties provided income for the deity and for the priests conducting the worship. Uh, Prabhupada also gave an example because this was the, the temple of the Malik family. And he gave another example in Lucknow, there's the Singhania family. And there's the tower there, the big tower, Singhania Tower. 
And they have a, I think it's Lakshmi Narayan temple there. And all of the family members, they're obligated to visit the temple every day. And if they don't visit the temple, they have to pay a fine. <laughs> because uh, it was Prabhupada's friend, Pratap Narayan Singhania. He made that rule for the whole family, very wealthy family in steel. But everyone had to come and worship the deity every day in the family. So here in the Radhagal Vindaji temple, um, all these properties, the income, was supporting the temple and supporting the pujaris of the temple. Every morning before breakfast, the Malik family members would visit the temple to see the deity of Radha Govinda. They would offer cooked rice, kachori, and vegetables on a large platter and would then distribute the prasadam to the deity's morning visitors from the neighborhood. So this was the center of the whole neighborhood, the Radha Govindaji temple. Among the daily visitors was Abhay Charan, accompanying his mother, father, or servant. Now, Srila Prabhupada, he has a memory here. Prabhupada says, I used to ride on the same perambulator, that's the baby carriage, with Siddhishwar Malak. He was one of the neighbor boys, because all the, many, many families and lots of children, they were all about the same age growing up together. So this Malik's uh, name was Siddhishwar Malik. He used to call me Moti, which means pearl. And his, his nickname was Subidi. <laughs> and the servant pushed us together in the same carriage. If one day this friend did not see me, he would become mad. He would not go in the perambulator without me. We would not separate even for a moment. So this was Prabhupada's childhood. In the early morning, he would go in the carriage to take darshan of Radha Govindaji. As the servant pushed the baby carriage into the wide expanse of Harrison Road, timing his crossing between the bicycles and horse-drawn hackneys, because you have to remember this is the uh, 1896, Prabhupada was born, so it was the 19th century. There were no cars at that time. There weren't even trolley trams. It was just horse carriages and bicycles and rickshaws, people-drawn rickshaws. The two children in the pram gazed up at the fair sky and tall trees across the road. Now, I learned this secret. You see, Sasru Maharaj, he was sitting in America at Gita Nagari, he lived there. But he sent disciples all around India to find out what the geography was of these different places. So from those descriptions given to Satsrup Maharaj, he was able to set the scene of all these places. So he, that's why he says, gazed up at the fair sky and tall trees across the road. So from these devotees who went to this place, they reported back to him that there were tall trees and you were able to see the sky. And then he entered that into the Lilamrita. Sounds and sights of the Hackneys with their large wheels spinning over the road caught the fascinated attention of the two children. The servant steered the carriage towards the arched gateway within the red sandstone wall bordering the Radha Govinda Mandir. So again, this, these uh, reporters, they reported back to him there was a red stone, sandstone entrance and like that. So he could put all these details into the Prabhupada Lilamrita even though he personally didn't see the places. And as Abhai and his friend rode underneath the ornate metal arch and into the courtyard, they saw high above them two stone lions, the heralds and protectors of the temple compound. Their right paws extended. Now I'm going to see if they have a picture of um, these lions. I have seen them, but I don't know if it's in this book or not. 
This is the courtyard. See, there's a Garuda praying to Radha Govindaji. And this is the courtyard that Prabhupada would, en would enter into. And we'll see. Okay. In the courtyard was a circular drive and on the oval lawn were lampposts with gas lights and a statue of a young woman in robes. Sharply chirping sparrows flitted in the shrubs and trees or hopped across the grass, pausing to peck the ground, while choruses of pigeons cooed, sometimes abruptly flapping their wings overhead, sailing off to another perch or descending into the courtyard. That sounds like our temple, with the pigeons flying here and there. <laughs> Voices chattered as Bengalis moved to and fro, dressed in simple cotton saris and white dhotis. Someone paused by the carriage to amuse the golden-skinned boys with their shining dark eyes, but mostly people were passing by quickly, going into the temple. The heavy double doors leading into the inner courtyard were open, and the servant eased the carriage wheels down a foot deep step and proceeded through the foyer, then down another step and into the bright sunlight of the main courtyard. These are the steps that are being described here. There they faced a stone statue of Garuda, perched on a four foot column. This carrier of Vishnu Garuda, half man and half bird, kneeled on one knee, his hands folded prayerfully, his eagle's beak strong, and his wings poised behind him. The carriage moved ahead past two servants sweeping and washing the stone courtyard. It was just a few paces across the courtyard to the temple. The temple area itself, open like a pavilion, was a raised platform with a stone roof supported by stout pillars. 15 feet tall. You can see these pillars here. Now you have to remember also, when this book was written, the Prabhupada Lilamrita, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have video cameras, all we had was pencil, pen and paper. <laughs> or we had little cassette tapes with it the devotee who was walking in here could describe all these details so that it can be put into the book for us. At the left end of the temple pavilion stood a crowd of worshippers viewing the deities on the altar. The servant pushed the carriage closer, lifted the two boys out, and then, holding their hands, escorted them reverentially before the deities. So that means that the boys were old enough to walk. That means they must have been more than two years old. As the servant picked them up out of the carriage and took them up to the deities for darshan. Now Srila Prabhupada remembers. I can remember standing at the doorway of Radha Govinda Temple saying prayers to Radha Govinda Murti. I would watch for hours together. The deity was so beautiful with his slanted eyes. I will get a close-up here. This is a close-up of Govinda Ji. Slanted like this, yes. You see his slanted eyes here. Can you see? Oh. Later you can see. Okay. They go almost to his ears like this. Radha and Govinda, freshly bathed and dressed, now stood on their silver throne amidst vases of fragrant flowers. 
Govinda was about 18 inches high, and Radharani standing to his left was slightly smaller. Both were golden. Radha and Govinda both stood in the same gracefully curved dancing pose, right leg bent at the knee and right foot placed in front of the left. Now this is quite extraordinary. Um, our Radha Sham Sundar, we know that Krishna is Tribunga. He's folded, he's um, bent in three places, his shoulders, his waist, and his knees. And our Radharani, she stands with her feet straight, if, uh, if the, the Pujaris can confirm this. But the, both the deities, Radha Madan Mohan, where Prabhupada had his Shasti Puja, and Radha Govindaji, both Radharanis are also Tribunga. They're not standing straight. So that's what's confirmed here, that Radha and Govinda both stood in the same gracefully curved dancing pose, right leg bent at the knee and right foot placed in front of the left. So our Radharani is not like that. Her feet are straight, right? Radharani, dressed in a lustrous silk sari, held up her reddish right palm in benediction. And Krishna, like this. So there are different mudras of Radharani. When Srila Prabhupada wanted the Radharani carved here, because Krishna and Balaram, he chose what they would look like. There was a beautiful picture in the back of um, one of the Back to Godhead magazines that one of the artists, Bardraj, had painted. So Prabhupada took that picture and said, this is the way Krishna Balaram should be carved. And Bharadraj came to Vrindavan and he went to Jaipur to oversee that carving, that it would be done just like that. When Radha Sham Sundar were to be carved, he explained to Jamuna that Radharani should be in a very special mudra pose. Because generally, the Lakshmi Devi deities, or even the Radharani deities, they have their right hand giving benediction like this. And their left hand might be holding a lotus, or might be just at the side. But Prabhupada did not want Radharani in that pose here. He stood in a position and showed Jamuna how he wanted the deities. He wanted Radharani dancing. Now Radharani's hands, of course, nowadays, due to the love of all of the Matajis, they pile up so many flowers onto, the de onto Radharani's hands, you can never see her hands. She has a bouquet in each hand, she'll have a garland. You can't see, but in the, in the early days here in the temple, uh, Radharani, her hands are dancing. She's like this. She's always dancing. Krishna's playing his flute and Radharani's dancing. <laughs> so maybe someday we'll ask the Matajis to not make all the things in Radharani's hands and then we can all see Radharani dancing as Krishna plays his flute. <laughs> huh? The well, you make them. <laughs> <laughs> her reddish right palm in benediction and Krishna in his silk jacket and dhoti played on a golden flute at Govinda's lotus feet were green tulsi leaves with pulp of sandalwood hanging around their lordship's necks and reaching down almost to their lotus feet were several garlands of fragrant, night-blooming jasmines, delicate trumpet-like blossoms resting lightly on Radha and Govinda's divine forms. Their necklaces of gold, pearls, and diamonds shimmered. Radharani's bracelets were of gold, and both she and Krishna wore gold-embroidered silk chutters about their shoulders. 
Now, this is one difference, another difference. Um, when Srila Prabhupada established this temple, he did not allow us to have any gold or silver for their lordships. Why is that? That's because he said that the devotees are coming from all different backgrounds. And if we entice them with gold and silver, they might fall back into their previous habits and they might get the inspiration to steal. So therefore, we should not have any gold and silver here. So when Prabhupada was present, there was no gold and silver. After Prabhupada left, of course, devotees like to give gifts. So then they got gold and silver things, and sure enough, things always got stolen. And it was the inside job, <laughs> if you can understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so the gold and silver, um, on special days, sometimes they wear, but Prabhupada did not want the deities here to have gold and silver ornaments for that reason, just not to entice the devotees uh, in because of previous bad habits. The flowers in their hands and hair were small and delicate, and the silver crowns on their heads were bedecked with jewels. Radha and Krishna were slightly smiling. Beautifully dressed, dancing on their silver throne beneath a silver canopy and surrounded by flowers, to Abai they appeared most attractive. Life outside on Harrison Road and beyond was forgotten. In the courtyard the birds were chirping, went on chirping, and visitors came and went. But Abai stood silently, absorbed in seeing the beautiful forms of Krishna and Radharani, the Supreme Lord and his eternal consort. So when Prabhupada returned finally with some of his disciples to take darshan of Radha Govindaji, he was reminiscing how in his childhood this Radha Govindaji, Thakurbari, he called them, they were the inspiration of his life. And every, he said that everything that we're doing now in ISKCON came from what he saw here in the worship of Radha Govindaji. And he told the devotees, you are very fortunate that you're able to have this darshan of Radha Govindaji. Then the kirtan began. Devotees chanting and playing on drums and kartals. Abai and his friend kept watching as the pujaris offered incense, its curly smoke hanging in the air, then a flaming lamp, a conch shell, a handkerchief, flowers, a whisk, and a peacock fan. So Prabhupada, when he saw all these things, he would go home and do the same thing to his little Radha Govindaji uh, deities at home. Finally, the pujari blew the conch shell loudly and the arti ceremony was over. When Abai was one and a half years old, he fell ill with typhoid. The family physician, Dr. Bos, prescribed chicken broth because they were being influenced by the British. So Dr. Bos, Kartik Chandra Bos, the Bosch family, uh, he was very close friends with Prabhupada's father. And he said, because there were no antibiotics in those days that hadn't been discovered yet, uh, usually when you got typhoid, you would die from typhoid. So according to the British, the cure was to take chicken broth. Chicken broth is um, just like we have neem, and neem can cure hundreds of diseases by drinking it, by pasting it, this, that, the other thing. So in the Malecha culture, chicken broth is the cure-all. <laughs> because there's fat and it gives you strength 
And it's a, a malecha cure, just as we have neem and ghee and things like that. So Dr. Bosch prescribed chicken broth. No, Gormahan protested. I cannot allow it. There was no question of chicken broth in the home of the Vaishnavas, out of the question. And Dr. Bosch said, yes, otherwise he will die. But we are not meat eaters, Gormahan pleaded. We cannot prepare chicken in our kitchen. Don't mind, Dr. Bosch said. I shall prepare it at my house and bring it in a jar and you simply Gormahan assented anything to save the life of his son. If it is necessary for my son to live. So the doctor came with his chicken broth and offered it to Abai, who immediately began to vomit. <laughs> Abai couldn't accept it. <laughs> All right, the doctor admitted, never mind. This is no good. Gormahan then threw the chicken broth away and Abai gradually recovered from the typhoid without having to eat meat. On the roof of Abai's maternal grandmother's house was a little garden with flowers, greenery, and trees. Along with the other grandchildren, two-year-old Abai took pleasure in watering the plants with a sprinkling can. But his particular tendency was to sit alone amongst the plants. He would find a nice bush and make a sitting place. So we're just hearing about how fortunate Prabhupada was in his childhood, that both his mother and his father were pure Vaishnavas. And Prabhupada, particularly, if you read the beginning, the dedication to the Krishna book, Prabhupada dedicated the Krishna book to his father because it was his father who imbibed in him Krishna consciousness. His father was a Vaishnava to the point where, as we heard, he wasn't interested in making a lot of money. He liked to serve the Vaishnavas. He would bring them to his home, feed them. Every night, at least four to five sadhus would be fed. And he would pray to all of them, you please make my son a servant of Radharani. And while Rajani was very concerned that Prabhupada get a good education, A, B, C, one, two, three, Gormahan Day, he was concerned that Prabhupada learned how to play Murdanga. <laughs> so learning Murdanga and uh, learning how to worship the deities and becoming a servant of Srimati Radharani, these were the concerns of his father because he was a pure Vaishnava. One day when Abai was three, he narrowly escaped the fatal burning. He was playing with matches in front of his house when he caught his cloth on fire. Suddenly a man appeared and put the fire out. Abai was saved, although he retained a small scar on his leg. So those servants who used to massage Prabhupada, they, Prabhupada would show, the, show the, the servants his scar. And he said, out of nowhere, the man came. Because he was just lighting, he, couldn't un, he didn't realize how dangerous it was to play with fire. So he caught his cloth on fire, and then out of nowhere, a man came and put out the fire. In 1900, that means Prabhupada was, when Abai was four, a vehement plague hit cattle, Calcutta. This is the black plague caused by rodents. The, what it is is um, when there's a lot of rain, when the, uh, during the monsoon there's too much rain, there's a lot of extra crops and greenery and the fleas, you know, the little, little fleas, they increase in population because of all the rain. And the fleas live on the rats. And the rats go into the homes. 
And the fleas carry, just like mosquitoes carry malaria, the fleas carry plague. So the rodents are the carriers of the fleas. And the fleas bite the people, and in that way the people get this plague. And in plague you get these big lumps all over your body, the lymph glands all swell, and then you die. Sometimes when there would be plagues in Europe, 60% of the population would die because they had no cure for it. So it was that type of a plague in Calcutta. Dozens of people died every day and thousands evacuated the city. They went into the villages to escape because whenever there's a city, uh, there are a lot of rats because they, they find places to live. So they would go into the villages where there were no rats and it was cleaner, so then they would escape the plague. When there seemed no way to check the plague, an old Babaji organized Hare Krishna Sankirtan all over Calcutta. Regardless of religion, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and Parsis all joined and a large party of chanters traveled from street to street, door to door, chanting the names Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. The group arrived at Gormahan's house at 151 Harrison Road, and Gormahan eagerly received them. Although Abai was a little child, his head reaching only up to the knees of the chanters. He also joined in the dancing. Shortly after this, the plague subsided. So Prabhupada talks about this in more details. He, say, he gave the example that you see in our temples, the little children are there and they're only up to the knees of the adults during the kirtan, but the children are still taking part. So he remembers that he could only see up to the knees of all of the kirtan party. But then he said that this Babaji who started the Sankirtan, he was doing Sankirtan for a material purpose. And that's a form of Nama Parad. He said that actually we should not do Sankirtan to get some result. But because it was Sankirtan, and because the Babaji was chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, still it had effect because the plague subsided after that. Just like sometimes in a village when there's drought, there's no rain, they'll have 24-hour kirtan and then the rain will start. Just like in Hyderabad, they called the devotees, they had a big sankirtan and then it rained. But Prabhupada says that's a form of Nama Parad. We should never use the holy name for material purposes. So that was an afterthought to this that he explained later. Gorma, 10 minutes. Gormahan was a pure Vaishnava and he raised his son to be Krishna conscious. Since his own parents had also been Vaishnavas, Gormahan had never touched meat, fish, eggs, tea, or coffee. Now, tea was not a habit of the Indian population. Tea is a habit of the British. They have their four o'clock tea every day. It's their daily habit, routine. And tea grows very nicely in the hills, like in Assam and Sikkim. So it was the British who began the tea drinking in India. It was their propaganda. Prabhupada explains this. What they did was they would set up free tea stalls and they would give out free tea to all of the Indians. And tea is an intoxicant. So by drinking this free tea, the Indians became addicted. And then they started charging for the tea. <laughs> so in general, 
No Indians ever drank tea, and there was no such thing as coffee in those days. But it was because the British were addicted to tea, they got the Indians addicted to tea also, so that then the, the Indians would also buy tea. You'll learn later, we'll hear later, that just to get some tea biscuits, uh, Prabhupada's wife gave, you know, they would weigh, just like we have here, they go out, they're, they're selling, they're trading. They put on the scale anything old, and you can get the equal amount of bananas or, or amrud, whatever they have in their, their little rickshaw. So they would give tea biscuits in exchange for whatever was weighed. So she took the books of Prabhupada and got tea biscuits in exchange because she would drink tea. Though Prabhupada wouldn't drink tea. Uh, this is about Gormahande. His complexion was fair and his disposition was reserved. At night he would lock up his cloth shop, set a bowl of rice in the middle of the floor to satisfy the rats so that they would not chew the cloth in their hunger and return home. There he would read from Chaitanya Charitamrita and Srimad Bhagavatam, the main scriptures of Bengali Vaishnavas chant on his japa beads, and worship the deity of Lord Krishna. He was gentle and affectionate, and would never punish Abhai. Even when obliged to correct him, Gormahan would first apologize. You are my son, so now I must correct you. It is my duty. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's father would chastise him, so don't mind. Now, does anyone know any examples of when um, Jagannath Mishra would chastise Lord Chaitanya? There are some examples in the Chaitanya Bhagavat. But Gormahande, by nature, never wanted to punish Abhai, although sometimes he was ob obliged to do so. Srila Prabhupada, he was remembering. My father's income was no more than 250 rupees per month. But there was no question of need. Now 250 rupees per month was actually a lot in those days. Even when we came here, which was about 50 years ago, our workers, they would get one rupee a day, and if they were special mysteries, they would get one rupee 50 paisa a day. So one rupee could buy a lot in those days. So even an income of 250 rupees, he was considered uh, not wealthy, but upper middle class. But there was no question of need. In the mango season, when we were children, we would run through the house playing and we would grab mangoes as we were running through. And all through the day we would eat mangoes. We wouldn't have to think, can I have a mango? My father always provided food. Mangoes were one rupee a dozen. Life was simple, but there was always plenty. We were middle class, but receiving four or five guests daily. My father gave four daughters in marriage, and there was no difficulty for him. Maybe it was not a very luxurious life, but there was no scarcity of food or shelter or cloth. Daily, he purchased two and a half kilograms of milk, two and a half kilos of milk for his family. He did not like to purchase retail but would purchase a year's supply of coal by the cartload. Now Prabhupada in other places explains that when his father would purchase, he wouldn't just pay, buy one kilo of this, one kilo of that. No, he would buy a whole basket of something and bring it home to Rajani. And Rajani said, why did you buy so much? We'll never be able to eat so much. It'll just go to waste. But he would buy wholesale. And that way, it would be very cheap price. And even when Prabhupada came here, one day he was going on his morning walk. And in those days, 
from the villages because there were no, there was nothing here. It was just agricultural fields and all the villages nearby. They would come on their bicycles or with their bullock carts to, to the mandi in Loy Bazaar. There's a daily mandi to sell all their vegetables and their fruits and their flowers. So Prabhupada would go on his morning walk on this same road and sometimes he would stop the villagers coming in and he would see what they have and he would buy big stock <laughs> at a very low price and because the villager would think, well, I might as well sell it all to him, otherwise I have to go sit in the, in the Monday all day long trying to sell my, my sabji. And they would sell it all to Prabhupada, they would bring it back and we would have it for our prasadam here. So this is Prabhupada's habit that he learned from his father. Okay, so we'll stop now, there's just about two minutes. If anyone has any questions, Otherwise, we'll continue next week with the childhood pastimes of Srila Prabhupada. No, no, the Mullik's house. No, the British lived in a whole other part of Calcutta. So modern? It's just, no, it's not so much. I mean, it looks very nice now, all painted and, and well kept by the Gita Press. But it's a simple house, the way they would build. Of course, it was a wealthy family, so they would build very nice houses. And the days and the seals and the mullocks all lived in those houses on Harrison Road. Yes, Prabhu. How many children in Prabhupada's family? Prabhupada had five and, and also his father had five. Oh, oh, no, no, he said five children. He had, before I, I gave up five children, and now I have 500 children. <laughs> yes. Yes, right. And also he describes that uh, his mother died when he was 14 years old, so he didn't have much affection from his mother because she died at such a young age. Uh, but. Now he has so many mothers because when he came to America, his early disciples, there was Nandarani, uh, there was Malati. Prabhupada gives a, a name, the names, Janaki, um, who looked after him and Govinda Dasi. They looked after him just like a mother. They would see to all of his needs. So he said, I lost my mother, but now I have so many mothers to take care of me. <laughs> So this is the secret of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada was very concerned, uh, what will happen if I leave my home and my family? And he gave, because he kept getting the, the dream of his spiritual master that you must leave and take sannyas. So when he finally left, he left those five children. And then years later, he said, now I have 500 children. It was in the, in the 60s still, and there were just a few devotees, not 5,000, as when Prabhupada left us in 1977. Okay. That's what Krishna does. We give up our little bit that we consider to be ours, and then he gives us so much more. Any more questions? Yeah, all glories to Srila Prabhupada.